Okay, book review, book review. Autobiography of a Yogi. I did this book last week. Um, it's a 308 page book. I got it for free on Kindle. I actually, uh, I uh, Twittered it, tweeted it yesterday with my Kindle. So I think I'll start tweeting every time I do a book. I'm, um, uh, yeah, my Kindle Touch. You can get Kindles, Kindles for as low as like 60 bucks. I have 790 bucks on it. Anyways, um, I did this book because a friend of mine, like a year ago, said uh, they uh, read it. And, um, and it happened to just show up. It was one of the, it actually, um, I don't know how, but I put all 790 of my books on my Kindle. And um, like Kindle likes to, I guess, when they reset their program or the the uh, you know the version of the software on or whatever, you lose all the books. But it doesn't really matter anyways because you can always get it, get them all right back from your your mother load on on Yahoo. So you just type it in and it brings it back up. But I only had like and I don't know how these books were on there, but I only had like five books on there, and that happened to be one of them. So it was under Asian history. So I clicked it and I was like, all right, I might as well listen to that one. So. I listened to it, and um, so Autobiography of a Yogi is basically, it's, a, it's by a guy named uh, uh, Paramahamsa, Paramahansa Yogananda, um, who lived from 1895 to uh, 1952, and he was the first, he came over to America, uh, I think in like 35 to like, well, well for some from like 25, and then he lived the rest of his life here. And uh, so he was the first person to bring Eastern religion to America. So it's kind of like, it reminds me of the book Black Elk Speaks, which was the biography of Black Elk, the Elk Lala Sioux, uh, first cousin to uh, Crazy Horse, who, you know, was one of the Indians who fought Custer. And he was kind of like the, um, one of the, you know, the guy who brought, you know, Indian religion to America, you know, kind of remind me of that. So he... He introduced Indian religion to America. Um, Hindu, he's Hindu. And uh, um, I did the Wiki, I read the Wikipedia article about the book. It's uh, this is one of the most hundred spiritual books uh, according to Project Gutenberg, and a lot of famous people were into it because he uh, he had a huge following when he came over here. There are pictures in the book of him speaking to hundreds of people, and um, so. Basically, the synopsis of the book is uh, for the first, you know, half of it or whatever. It's 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 an autobiography, so it starts when he talking about his dad uh, was didn't was really was an educator. I think he was a professor, and he they owed him forty thousand dollars, but for some pension, and he didn't even ask for it. And when they finally gave it to him, he was like, oh, whatever, because he rode the bus to school to work every day. And and the, but then this kid, Paramahamsa. I guess his name is something else. That was his spiritual name, but they. Uh, but I think Yogananda was his real last name. I don't know. But um, he uh, he uh, wanted to be. He wanted to have a guru. So he took the train when he was like 17 to the Tibetan Himalayas to find his guru and went around. And I guess he eventually found a guru. And and then so the first part of the book is him just talking about all of his. Uh, um, all of these spiritual masters he's met in India and um, and all the magical things that they can do because they do this technique called Kriya Yoga. Uh, yoga, it's not yoga like stretching and stuff, it's it's meditation, it's like Kriya meditation, but in India yoga and meditation is kind of the same thing, it's uh, you know connecting to the higher forces and um, so yeah he met a lot of interesting people uh, and who could do lots of magical things and that was I listened to it on audiobook while I was working on other things so I don't really remember it like you would have read a book but I did listen last night to the uh, Kriya Yoga chapter chapter 26 and uh, um, so basically he brought he didn't invent Kriya Yoga Kriya, Kriya Yoga that's basically what the book is about Kriya Yoga um, Kriya Yoga uh, I guess his teacher was the one who refounded it, uh, rediscovered it. Um, I don't remember his name, and I didn't want to read the Wikipedia article about him, but it's this ancient technique. It's what uh, Krishna taught. And there's a, uh, there's a quote in the uh, Bhagavad Gita, 
um, where Krishna says, yeah, like when you exhale, you inhale the God ether, and then when you inhale, you exhale your own, or something like that. So it's to have constant um, rejuvenation. Anyways, this guy, uh, and then taught it to Yogananda, and then Yogananda practiced it. And then I'll, he's talking about all these other people in India who practice it. And there's one woman who, um, who like hasn't eaten for like uh, um, 20 years or something because she does it. Doesn't excrete anything, but she has normally looking glands and. Um, and some other guy who is like 300 years old because you can regenerate your cells. I, I, uh, when I listened to the um, chapter of Kriya Yoga last night, Kriya Yoga is basically, um, it's basically imagining uh, yourself connected to the, uh, the cosmos through all of your chakras, uh, the seven chakras. Um, and when you imagine, and especially um, including it in your breath, so when you inhale, you imagine yourself inhaling the uh, all of the uh, you know the cosmic forces to rejuvenate you and energize you that way, and um, and not just inhaling in your lungs, but inhaling in in all of your uh, chakras as well. Uh, just visualizing your chakras, you know. I think counterclock see my mom was telling me sometimes something about this last night it's really interesting because I like stumbled upon this book last week and then yesterday my mom all of a sudden out of the blue as we we're driving down to College Springs goes hey have you heard of a book called autobiography of yogi and it was the first thing she ever said I said well yeah I read it last night She's like oh yeah because I'm taking classes from a guy who's teaching Kriya Yoga oh wow she's like yeah and my mother studied with some yogini in the 30s and, and Virginia, and we think it was actually Paramahansa Yogananda who she was studying with. So was, and, uh, and the guy who my mom's studying with says that Yogananda believed himself to be the uh, reincarnation of uh, William the Conqueror, <laughs> he, who, who was uh, you know, a warlord, but he was a very capable person. So, um, so, so anyways, my mom was saying, I was telling her that when you inhale, or you know, inhale the you know spiritual energies through your chakras. It comes in uh, counterclockwise, and then when you're excreting the energy back out to the cosmos, it's clockwise. So maybe if you can help uh, imagine that and the colors of the chakra and all that kind of stuff, it actually helps you uh, bring in this etherical cosmic energy into all of your chakras, your seven chakras, starting from the coccyx base chakra. They they had a n different names for them, but and then up through your different chakras. But not like imagining it, because um, I was watching some videos. There's lots of videos on YouTube about Kriya Yoga. But you're not supposed to like conceptually imagine it. You're supposed to intuitively imagine it. And anyways, yeah, they, they practice it over and over again, and um, they eventually, and with, along with their breath, and they can eventually train themselves to have. I think they said like 18 to 32 breaths a day. So that's like almost. A breath every two hours so they're practically not not breathing it's not like they're holding their breath though they never hold their breath they're just breathing really slowly and feeling all the energy come in that um, uh, that like uh, oxidizes they're actually consciously oxidizing their cells and rejuvenating their cells and keeping themselves young as long as they want um, and uh, rejuvenating their body and you know feeding themselves and so they don't have to eat and um, I think that's part of one of the reasons it was so popular in America because it's just such a different culture and uh, they had a lot of and he did a brilliant job in that book of tying it in with Western religion he mentioned Jesus Christ and pretty much like every page like all the time he was mentioning it was practically like Jesus Christ was basically his number one guru and saying that Jesus Christ practiced Kriya Yoga and uh, so he tied it in with Western religion as well and uh, and um, he uh, yeah I think the people in America were really into it because he, you know they were just amazed by all the you know magical things that he said people back, back East did and um, my my idea about that is that you know I think that there are people out there who can train themselves through Kriya Yoga um, to uh, live 300 years um, or even longer 
Um, Bashar, the alien, says that there's a guy like in the mountains of Afghanistan or something who who's lived 300 years, and so there's one guy somewhere who lives like has lived been a thousand years old. And there's like half dozen guys who live 300 years, but yeah, I think people can train themselves to do pretty amazing stuff with that technique. Uh, I've heard on the coast to coast like some guy watched his girlfriend practice doing a meditation when she was underwater for an hour, you know, and stuff like that. Um, and uh, yeah, but you know, people would say to these people, you know, why don't you teach people the technique, like the finer techniques, and actually do demonstrations? And they never actually taught the de technique into these demonstrations. And my idea to that is maybe they lose the power; they can't do it when they're in the real world because they just break their concentration. You know, it's like it's kind of like uh, the movie of those superheroes, the Invisible Boy. He could only be invisible when nobody was looking. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that you can't believe him. Um, personally, I believe in that kind of stuff uh, because I've seen it. Um, I had a crack that went all the way across my windshield in my van, and one day he was just gone. He was there for four years, went almost all the way across, and he was just gone one day. So I believe in that stuff. And then two days later, my teeth, I did give teeth, the teeth came together, and a big thing of flesh of gum was hanging out between my teeth. And it's been like that ever since. So, And that was three days after the crack came together. So, um, And then all the you know stuff that athletes can do these days. So. Yeah, I believe that. I believe that stuff, and you know, you know, people are good at what they practice. Out here in the West, we practice making money and strengthening our economy. And in the India, they practice all that other stuff, and so they get good at it. And you know, so, um, so, but yeah, I think that's part of what was interesting to people. And also, this Yogananda. See, this book was written and published in '46. And uh, he tied it in with science very well. He was talking, he explained quantum physics about how every, and this is actually an old, um, it's written all over the Mahabharata. Um, uh, it's, you know, long been known in the East, but how everything's built of energy. Um, and perhaps, you know, Einstein actually came up with the whole uh, equals empty square idea, not from his own mind, but from reading the Bhagavad Gita, you know, or, I know that Oppenheimer quoted, and you can see the YouTube video of him. They asked him, well, um, uh, in uh, the atomic bomb in Hiroshima, was that the first time you know anybody had blown up a, an atomic bomb? And he said, well, yes, in modern times, because they do talk about an atomic bomb blowing up in the Mahabharata. I remember listening to it, but I, I forgot what part of it was, so I can't find it. But I remember they were talking about it, and very specifically, in one part and then kind of alluding to it in a lot of other parts. But, uh, and then, you know, Oppenheimer was all about quoting the Mahabharata, quoting the actual quote of the nuclear bomb and other stuff going off in Mahabharata. And you can see the YouTube video of him saying that kind of stuff. So, um, but anyway, he was, Yogananda was tying that in with, um, uh, he was explaining um, how everything is built of energy and, uh, and he was personal friends with some really, like, no, like a Nobel prize-winning physicist, Indian physicist, um, and uh, explaining quantum physics and, um, and um, you know, neutrons passing through you and how you can align the electrons and all that kind of stuff, yeah, so, but, you know, you can use your mind to influence your body, um, this guy, um, was it Dan Winter? They're talking about how you know, you can, um, like, you can you can trigger your cells to cre excrete certain enzymes and stuff that would, uh, you know, cause cancer or cause you to have adrenaline or whatever uh, through uh, the nucleuses of the cells communicating with each other. But the nucleuses are, are floating in the middle of the cell. How do they communicate with the outside of the cell? Well, the outside of the cell has certain little receptors that are a certain shape, and when they hit a scepter on the outside, that's a certain shape. It goes ah, oh, and then it brings a signal over, floats the signal over to the uh, to the nucleus, and and you can bring those you know those little uh, messenger enzymes or proteins, I guess they're proteins um, with your mind. You know these are very small. Um, uh, you know proteins are the smallest are the smallest like thick matter. They're not that much bigger than atoms, so. Um, so you can control that stuff with your mind. One, one proof of that is the double slit experiment. Um, when you turn the camera off and you're not looking at it, the electrons will, uh, will start going in. 
all at once, you know, and it'll just look like all the electrons are going all at once in it, you know, bouncing into each other, making all those multiple lines. But when you turn the camera on, even though the camera has nothing to do with the electrons going through, it changes it and you can see it. So our actions can actually influence uh, physical things that are barely physical because they're so small, uh, which can then influence the larger physical things. And the double slit experiment works with, uh, with buckyballs, with little uh, molecules of 60 carbon atoms all put together, placed together in a big, uh, um, uh, you know, one of those big uh, Buckminster Fuller um, octic uh, sphere things, pieces of matter. It, that double slit experiment works with that too. So, anyways, that's kind of. Uh, but yeah, they, they explained it with science pretty well in that book. And, um, and then in the book, they had another really interesting part. And this is where it really ties into Christianity pretty well. Because he was basically, just, he was describing all the different levels of heaven. I guess there's seven different levels of heaven, maybe corresponding to the seven different chakras. And we're on the first level of, I guess, physicality. And then you get higher, you know, as you get closer to phys the spirituality. But he was explaining... Um, higher realms, and this, and he, was, he wasn't saying like, being vague about it, he was saying in some planets, actual planets, um, this is what life is like, where, you know, light is really subtle, it never gets totally dark because light permeates everything. Uh, when you die, it's because you just choose to die. You just leave your body um, at will. Um, and what you imagine appears. So you want yourself a burrito, it just appears. And if you ask a Christian to just, just explain heaven, that's basically what they'll say. So it's basically, you know, it's very compatible. And uh, I think that's something that was very uh, appealing to the Christians in America. And, and he also mentioned God all the time. You know, it just uses, but, but God, like the one God and um, the primal force. And, uh, and he called it God, which I think is cool. He didn't say like, Atman or something like that, you know, or like Allah. He said God, so, um, and, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I didn't listen to that article, that particular chapter explaining all the different levels of heaven again, but, um, I wish I did last night. I thought I would like to, I can't now cause I, my mom would listen to it and I loaned her the uh, Kindle, but, um, she was telling me the guy who she's studying with here in Boulder, uh, says that, um, you know, part of. I guess what Yogananda taught, this guy was the student of Yogananda, said uh, um, like angels are actually watching over us the same way that we watch over pets. We look at our pets and we pet our pets and with the pet, you know, wants to get to the next level, you know, learn tricks or something or go running, we help them and we try to help them along. And that's the same way that angels are to us, they're not guardian angels and our guides and stuff. They're always looking over us and, you know, and if we look up and we pray, they come and they give us energy and, and, and information and so, you know, whatever, like, you know, what you ask for, you shall receive because they're always there doting on us. And, um, you know, and so whatever you want to know, you learn. You just, you just have to open yourself to it. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and he says that, uh, that it takes, in the book, it says that it takes about a million years to get through, you know, the realm of humanity before you can get to the higher realm, like the angelic realm. And, uh, and once you get there, you can come back to the earth if you want to help people here and act as a teacher. And, um, and, uh, but he says, and that's, and that's interesting to have an actual number to it, you know. Humanity has been around 250,000 years when they created humans out of uh, Homo erectus and uh, Anunnaki, so we're about a quarter, or a quarter of the way through our evolution, but we had some other planets before this, Mars and then Malbec before that, so maybe we're farther ahead of that. But uh, Kriya Yoga can speed up your soul evolution. They said one minute of Kriya Yoga meditation is like equal to like 300,000 years or something of uh, meditation or something. So maybe in one lifetime you can Kriya Yogify yourself into the angelic realms. But, um, but anyways, yeah, the, the, I guess some of the people who had the special skills were kind of apprehensive to teach like the uh, the, the more detailed, finer teachings because they didn't want to, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe you can use it if you're not um, evolved enough, you can use it like 
for negative purposes. I don't know. They didn't explain that in the book. But the book is really, um, if you wanted to read it, you know, and you're not totally into the book. Um, and my mom said my brother read it too. But uh, you might want to skip the first half of it because I was a little bit, it was a little bit bored with all of the references to all the magical things that these people he met did. It was kind of like just bragging over and over again what they could do. And I was like, come on, are you just trying to like, you know, impress me and stuff? And it kind of was a little bit boring. And then details of his life, you know, and then I went here and then I told him that. And so if you want to just get the juicy part, just listen to like the final third, you know, at least listen to the Kriya Yoga uh, chapter and then the chapter about heaven. I don't know which one that one is, but um, that part is really interesting. And to learn Kriya Yoga is really interesting. It's, um, isn't that similar to Kabbalah? Kabbalah is kind of meditation uh, based on the different chakras. Um, and uh, so, uh, um, yeah, I know in, in Buddhism, the people who can go to the higher realms, angelic realms, and come to earth are called bodhisattvas. Uh, I think that had another name for it in Hinduism, but it's pretty similar. The history, according of Kriya Yoga, is that yeah, they used to do it back in the past a lot, but then the priests were really secretive with it, and then the people didn't have interest. So then it kind of, and then they went into the age of uh, like materialism, and so they lost it, and then they they learned it again in like 1860 with his teacher. Um, but in one chapter, towards the beginning, they're talking about the yugas, uh, and he said that you know we had like a we have like the new yuga of our blossoming of humanity which will last until like 4,100 or something so for like another 2,000 years so so I guess we're entering another one now um, I know with astrology every like 2,160 years you get into a new um, astrological sign we just left the fish sign that's why fish is the signal for Christianity and we're moving into Aquarius um, and it's a little bit different with uh, depending on what you know part of the world you're in but the fact of the matter is that um, astrology originally came from India. So if you wanted to really know what the true astrology, astro astrological signs and dates of transitions are, you'd want to just listen to the Indians because that's where it came from. They got it from their their uh, their Vedas, um, written in like you know 1500 BC or something, um, and then the, it entered into uh, the Middle East. And then it entered into the West. So it's not like it all came, it all like sprouted from all over the world. And you know, we have our version, they have their version. We actually learned it from there, it came from India. So, um, so yeah, it's a cool book. I enjoyed it. Um, if you see the picture of the guy, you've seen him before. He's been around, he has a really long black hair. According to them, if you're like really spiritual, if you have really long hair and a big beard, <laughs> But you know they had the women peep too, the, like a woman who hadn't eaten for 20 years. But they're, she's so evolved that she didn't really see herself as a uh, as a man or a woman, just as a spiritual being. Because that's the, that's the key to Kriya Yoga is to see yourself as a feel yourself as a universal, um, uh, eternally living spiritual being, and focus on that. And when you focus on that, you can actually connect yourself to the higher more um, uh, more permanent energy that then can then open up the gateways to then fill you up with all that energy that life force when rejuvenate your cells and uh, keep you alive and all that kind of stuff Yogananda did die at the age of 59 <laughs> but um, this is how it happened he was at a talk in America giving a talk you know it's one of his talks and then all of a sudden he said Something like, oh, I am, uh, so now I bequeath my soul to the everlasting uh, energy forces or something. And then he just slumped over and, and died. So he chose him, he chose to die. He left his body when he wanted to, just like a bodhisattva, just like uh, one of these people in the angelic realms in front of a bunch of people. So that's pretty cool. So uh, check it out. Kriya Yoga, K R I. Y-A, yoga, peace out.